thank you very much for this distinguished uh, uh, panel. Of a lot for us to sort of chew on and think about. Now, I want to call up our second panelist. I see uh, the two mayors are here in the audience. Can you please come and join us with the uh, here up front, please? And when they come and you see that, I'll introduce them and we'll let them uh, uh, proceed. Thank you so much. Of the debate, but it's certainly a pleasure to be part of the discussion. I thought 
listening to the national panel was really interesting. I focus so much on the state level, so that I sometimes forget that other states and other nations also have a problem. So I thought it was very, very interesting. So and I will look forward to the presentations um, and we receive the hard copies as well. Now, uh, what is the problem? Some of it has been mentioned uh, before, mainly by Mrs. Norcross. There are about 110 municipal plans that are on in the state system. And this is not the focus of what I want to talk about today. Uh, I want to focus on the local administrative plans, and that will be uh, the, the discussion uh, that we have now. As uh, has been mentioned before, these locally administered it is so. Can you hear me better? Mm -hmm. Is that better? No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Let me try. Can you hear me now? Yeah. 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 All right. Oh, okay. All right, I will stay as close as possible. And just raise the hand, especially in the back, if you can't hear me, then I will use some of the other mics. All right. <laughs> so there are, so I just want to mention a few things that I said that you may not have heard. There are about 110 municipal plans that are in the state system, but this is not the focus of uh, our panel here. Uh, we focus on the locally administered pension plans. There are, uh, they have an accrued unfunded liability of uh, 2.1 billion with an aggregate funding level of 40% and luckily to uh, the Auditor General, we know um, how these plans are administered. He really releases great reports. There are uh, 34 locally administered plans now excluding Central Falls since they are in the bankruptcy proceedings so they have been excluded from our uh, reports that we are releasing since they are in a separate state oversight. Of those 34 plans, uh, 22 local plans or almost uh, two-thirds are administered by 17 municipalities, have a funded ratio below 60 percent, which is considered critical status under the new state law that was passed uh, last November. And 12, of course, then are above the critical status. Now, quickly, what might happen if we do not address these unfunded liabilities? For one, it could have an impact on retirees, and Gail will talk uh, about that later on. So Central Falls was really um, a case study that we do hope will not happen again. So it was really um, some deep cuts for retirees. It could also have an impact on active employees as well as on taxpayers in other municipalities. Uh, we just recently reported on the West Warwick pension plan, so if nothing would happen there, this pension plan would run out of money in 2017. So that is really not that far out, since you have to have uh, to do a few things uh, in order to get uh, your house in order. So 2017 is not that far out, so things have to happen now in order to address the issues. Another area why it's important to address it is the um, rating agencies. Moody's released a report uh, just a while ago in December 2011. Uh, it was called Rhode Island Local Governments Face Elevated Credit Pressure. And they have been downgrading municipalities based on unfunded liabilities. So if you are downgraded, that could lead to higher borrowing costs. So that would have an impact on all of the municipalities. So these are just a few facts why it's really, really important to address the unfunded liabilities. Now what I do want to focus on what uh, the state has been done to address the issue. Uh, Governor Chafee as well as the treasurer have proposed major pension reform on the state level and it was enacted by the General Assembly in uh, November 2011. And uh, Mrs. Norquist talked about that so I just uh, don't really want to mention it again. So, But there were some major changes. Uh, people, new employees uh, will retire social security age now, for me, at my age level, that will be 67 as it currently stands. COLA suspension, uh, if a plan is um, below 80% funded. These are just some major areas and then the hybrid plan. So that was happening on the state level. The pension reform also addressed to a certain degree uh, local administered pension plans. For one, it established a 14-member commission. Uh, members include uh, the Auditor General, who's sitting to my right, 
as well as uh, mayors, town administrators, uh, the treasurer, union representatives, state officials, and the RIPEC again. So it's a very diverse group coming together uh, every other week to really address uh, these issues on the local level. The, it does not address the state plan, so to be clear, it only addresses the locally administered pension plans. What the reform also did that passed in November is uh, um, it wanted to, we really wanted to understand what the problem is. That's why municipalities were asked to perform an actuarial evaluation as well as an experience study and both reports had to be submitted to the, uh, to the study commission by April 1st. So it's really important to understand what the problem is and get uh, good data. So that was a, a critical step uh, to do that. Another area that was a part of the uh, reform was to provide for transparency. All the plants in critical status, again, below 60% funded, had to send uh, critical status notices to all the plan beneficiaries and to a selected group of uh, state officials and as well the, uh, the General Assembly to ensure that people knew where and what uh, position the municipal plans are. Lastly, and that is now the most uh, critical point, is municipalities should use all of that information and submit a funding improvement plan if they are below 60% funded, and that plan is due by November, no later than November 11, 2012. Going forward, as I have said, 22 plans are in critical status, so that means these 22 plans have to submit a funding improvement plan. The, that funding improvement plan, municipalities have to submit four reasonable plans to the commission using reasonable assumptions. The commission will look at all of these plans and see if, um, if the guidelines have been met. There will be a penalty if these funding improvement plans are not submitted or if the local governing body, mainly the council or the pension board, did not approve one of these plans in going forward with the plan. Um, that is, in a nutshell, Marion only gave us five minutes to discuss uh, many, many things. So um, I'll certainly answer questions later on. We're going to have time. We're going to save some time for Q&A. So Great. thank you very thank much, you. Marion, uh, thank you. It's uh, great to be here and participate in this uh, forum. Uh, the Office of the Auditor General has issued three reports on, in recent years on the local pension plans. The first was in July of 2007, a second in March 2010, and the most recent in September of last year. So I'd like to think that we drew some early attention and focused on the poorly funded status of these plans through our reports. Obviously, more recently, there's been intense focus from every corner on all governmental defined benefit plans. Our reports on the local pension issue have tried to highlight those plans we deemed at risk basically by identifying those that were less than 60% funded, those that were not contributing the annual required contribution or the ARC, or those with an unfavorable trend rate with respect to meeting the ARC. And as mentioned before, we had identified 24 of the 36 plans as at risk based on that criteria in our most recent report. Not surprisingly, the collective funded ratio of those plans declined from our first report in 2007 when the plans were 45% funded uh, to just 40% more recently. Uh, that report also took a look at OPEB liabilities for the municipalities. I know we're not focusing on that today, but the collective unfunded liability was $3.5 billion for the OPEB plans, which overshadows the $2.1 billion for the locally administered pension plans. So our reports have included information on the percentage of the ARC actually made to each of the plans over a five-year period, which is important to really see the trend in whether people are increasing or decreasing the uh, required contributions. I think the questionable sustainability of some of the plans is well demonstrated when the annual required contribution for all pension and OPEB plans is between 50 to 60 percent of the annual property tax levy, as it is in certain communities. Not all communities, but just certain. Uh, we've recommended or favored a move in of these local plans into MERS. I believe there are a number of very strong advantages to participating in a larger system for investment diversification, reduced administrative costs, but most importantly, for the discipline of making the required contributions. On a more positive note, while the problem is certainly not solved, I think the focus has been beneficial in increasing awareness and general level of understanding about what constitutes good pension plan governance. 
it's uh, surprising how many folks are now conversing about arcs and other actuarial terms to say compared to five years ago. <coughs> Uh, we've also seen uh, recent pension plan changes that just a short time ago would have been viewed as unlikely, if not impossible. Over the next few years, trying to assess the health or funded status of, the gov of a governmental plan may get more complicated. As referred to earlier, the uh, GASB, uh, the Governmental Accounting Standards Board, has released new pension accounting standards in June of this year. While that ordinarily is not all that newsworthy, uh, given the current focus on pensions, this does warrant a bit of attention. GASB's new standards, which generally become applicable in 2015 for employers, de-link the financial reporting aspect with the funding mechanism. And the important <laughs> thing there that's really going to result from that is I think there's going to be two sets of numbers circulating around for each of these plans. And I think that's probably going to add to the confusion rather than uh, diminish it. So I think that's a, a really important uh, thing to note. So just for example, and, and certainly I can't summarize the uh, GASB provisions here, but um, for financial reporting purposes, the plan will value the unfunded liability based on the market value of assets as of the balance sheet date, rather than a smooth market value, which most plans use now, which generally uh, does an average over a five-year period. Uh, so I think, and it was also referred to uh, earlier, too, that Moody's, again, too, they were throwing out their ideas on how they might value these pension liabilities and did seek comments on that. Uh, I don't believe that they've issued a final uh, decision on how they're going to treat that, but that was likely going to result in a third set of numbers for the plan. So I think we're entering an era that uh, is probably the discussion is going to focus on which set of numbers should I use to decide whether the plan is well-funded or not, and I think those could be somewhat divergent. So um, that's just a little background. As um, Suzanne mentioned, I do sit on the uh, Local Pension Study Commission. We're anxiously awaiting the funding improvement plans in November, and I think based on that, the next phase is to um, make some recommendations to the General Assembly on some potential statutory changes. So thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Now, why don't we go next to the Mayor of Ward, and I want to say to Gail uh, for, for last, if you can talk about what happened in, in Central Falls. So, uh, Mayor Atkinson, thank you so much for being here. Please. My pleasure, Mayor, and thank you. Um, the City of Warwick has four locally uh, administered pension plans. Three of our plans are performing well and are the only ones that are ranked in the first tier of the state's new eight-tier ranking system. Um, our fourth um, pension plan uh, is performing poorly and is um, in tier four. Our current funding ratios of our four pension plans and the municipal plan is currently funded at 71%. Police two is funded at 86.5%. Uh, Fire two is funded at 78%. And then the problematic plan, plan, police and fire one, is funded at 22.3%. It's inter interesting to know that that plan is a closed plan and has a 40-year funding formula uh, that was passed by our city council a number of years ago um, to make that plan um, actually uh, fully funded, and that's in place by our, our local ordinance that the council passed. Um, all of our uh, current ratios include the new state assumptions that were uh, adopted by the state last year. Uh, and it's interesting to note that we have the same actuary firm as the state. We purposely chose that so that when we were going through um, pension uh, discussions and pension reforms, we would be able to say that the, what, it, what was going on on one level, we would be in concert with the state um, on that as well. And the new assumptions include 7.5% estimated rate of return and new mortality rates um, projecting longer life expectancy so that we're currently um, up to date on where we need to be on that as well. Um, and we made that decision to hire the same actuary so that we could adopt the same assumptions um, and, and allow us to be in concert with what the state was doing. There are a number of self-correcting mechanisms that are in our pension plans. Um, Municipal retirement system currently is comprised of about 400 active employees and a little over 320 uh, retirees, and that average pension is $1,660 per month. The municipal plan, there is no COLA if the investment returns are not favorable, and um, since we know the market has not been great lately, there has been no COLA approved for the past three years. 
The colas in the newer police two and fire two at fixed at 3%, and in the closed police and fire one, they're tied to what existing employees um, receive as a raise, and we just uh, negotiated new contracts uh, for the next three years with no salary increases across the three years, which will save on the uh, COLA, which will lower the unfunded pension liability by about $32 million in total. Um, new, lo new labor contracts, um, oh, oh, I'm sorry, also, the employee level uh, is not fixed. Uh, the, the contribution level between employees and the city is not fixed. It goes one-third and two-thirds, depending on where we are, so that fluctuates every year. So there's a recalculation of what both parties are paying into the pension plan each year. Um, new labor contracts, um, as I said, went into effect on July 1. Um, they're significant because not only do they include no increases, no salary increases for three years, but it was a higher uh, health care co-payment as well. Um, and that provided for about a million dollars worth of savings, but most importantly was the zeros over the three years meant that the COLA for um, the retirees was reduced by 32 million, the unfunded pension liability reduced by 32 million. Um, in June of 2010, um, we moved forward with a series of pension reforms to the city council. They were approved, uh, and that uh, targeted the age at which in individuals can retire. So anyone hired after July 1 of this year goes into the new pension um, system and the new pension requirements. So the age was increased at what time you can retire. The formula for determining the percentage of salary that someone would get was increased. Um, the annual cost of living was decreased to the, and, and the length of time that someone can receive a disability pension was changed as well. In fact, we stole that fair and square from the city of Pawtucket that had changed their disability pension um, regulations a couple years ago. Um, and then we also looked at um, the re police and fire retirement age, uh, at least 50 with 25 years of service. So what we've tried to do is look at a number of different changes, not only on what we could do um, in the existing contracts um, based on what the COLA provisions were, but also setting forth um, some changes in anyone hired after July 1 of this year. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. <coughs> Thank you, Matt. Um, let me tell you a little bit about me first. I'm from the city of Pawtucket. I've been there about 22 months, and we have a $12 million structural problem that we inherited, so we've been dealing with that. But now we start talking about the pension problems and the OPEP problems we have. Um, well, it's been a good thing, I say unfortunately, but I've got to know Dennis and Suzanne very, very well um, over the last 22 months coming in and having you know, the unfunded liability that we have. Currently, Pawtucket has uh, two pension, three if you, we're into MERS, we have some employees in MERS, but the unfunded uh, private pension plans, we have two. We have the pre-74 plan, which has less than a uh, 100 members in there, and there is a, about a $34 million pay-as-you-go um, process that we follow. The other uh, pension that we have is uh, about $145 million, um, it's 34% funded. So we do not meet as the state requires the 60% mark, and we all know that it should be a lot higher. Um, so we have these situations that we've been dealing with. Um, we have, we heard about the rate of returns, the rate of returns have been uh, changing, and we've been dealing with these issues. Um, what we did was to try to correct that is we put a pension ad hoc committee together and uh, the former uh, Auditor General Ernie Amante, besides the current and uh, state uh, reps, served on that, had members there, and we just had it released today. And what we identified were the problems. We put it down in numbers. We know the numbers. We're looking at the solutions. A lot of what we're trying to do as we go forward is we're going to be taking those problems, those solutions, putting a plan together as the state is required by m November 11th, and we have to put in four plans or four options on how we're going to correct that problem. First one is, if we put everything into MERS, what would it look like and what are the costs? And then we have to have three other um, options that we need to supply. It has to go through city council approval and then the state as well as how we're going to correct those things. And we look at our current um, experience. Uh, we just did an experience study. We have a $12 million art payment that we're paying, so we're just under 100% because we're always working off of last year's numbers or so a little behind. Um, based on the experience study, we have a $400,000 increase that will bring us up to the 100% next year. That's using a 7.875 rate of return, though. The state has uh, imposed on their system a 7.5, and then when you look at what the standards are and the suggestions are, you know, it can be anywhere from 4.5 up to the 7.5. And so that'll make some significant uh, increases 
and the, the issues that we're dealing with. And we were looking at numbers this morning, and as I said, the $12 million payment that we make right now on the ARC is based on the 7.875. But if you look at the 7.5, just to make the change, and when you're looking at it from the perspective, it, that's an increase of about $5.4 million um, just to change that, which means on our current tax rate, when you balance it, and that's some of the responsibilities that we, the mayors have, is you're looking at, that could be $1.65 to my residents who are well over tax now. So the way we look at changes, some of these things is through the pension ad hoc committee with the recommendations, but we're also looking to, and I talk about the uniqueness and being new at this, I say, you know, being 22 months, we have all our current contracts are up. Uh, we have five contracts that we're looking at. How do we make those changes, such as uh, some of the good changes that Warwick has made? Look at the, the ages, when you're talking about OPEB, the percentage and requirements. So we're taking in those, those into account when making those changes. There are a lot of things that have to happen. There are a lot of factors that we all talk about. But you need to change the benefit structure. Uh, we need to change the COLAs. Uh, our COLA problem is not as significant as other communities uh, because we've been paying the OC payment, paying as you go. But when you look back, and again, not to blame, we need to look forward, but over the last uh, 20 years, there's been about 10 years that people put very minimal, if no dollars, into what our payment should be and never made that OC payment. So we look at what the administration costs are, how do we reduce those, the age limitations. We look at the contributions that we're going to be putting in as well as what the employees can do. And then just looking at the base pay calculation. Those are the types of things that we're looking at now as we go forward. And now for us is the right time from the city of Pawtucket's perspective because we have the, all the contracts that are open. Um, you know, this has been a fun 22 months, as I say that, and that goes to the comment that Marion had made that, you know, unopposed because nobody else I say this, and with all due respect, is crazy enough to want to do the job. And, and it really is a significant issue as we try to balance our budget, you know, and we understand that, you know, we have the high unemployment and the tax rate that we have. So those are some of the issues we're looking at. Thank, Thank you. you. And now Gail, Gail Corgan is, the, as I said, the chief of staff or the receiver of Central City of Central Falls. So you hear, I suspect, a bit about Central Falls. Uh, yes, uh, today actually is a very historic day for Central Falls. Um, as of today, you cannot say that Central Falls is in bankruptcy. Today is the effective day of the bankruptcy plan, and uh, Central Falls is still in receivership, but is no longer in bankruptcy. So that's kind of a took a little bit from 14 months, and with a lot of help from <coughs> the state and people surrounding me, uh, the city managed to do it. Um, but today I'd like to uh, show you some numbers about where we were before we filed for bankruptcy on 8-1. Uh, 2011, we had a $6.1 million structural deficit uh, on $16.2 million of revenues. There's like $22.3 million of expenses. If the city funded its ARC as it was, should have, um, that would be $6.9 million in, pen, ten, in pension and retiree health, or 43% of the revenues. And um, it had an $8 million um, in pension plan assets with a combined unfunded liability in excess of $80 million. So obviously, uh, pensions were a big reason why Central Falls uh, filed for bankruptcy. And um, we've heard a lot today that uh, pensions, it's a math problem. But one of, one of the things I want to talk about is that it's also a cultural problem. And as chief of staff, uh, not only did I manage the, the city's operations day to day, but I was also lead negotiator uh, in our bargaining with the three unions. We have a, a FOP, or Fraternal Order of Police, International Association of Firefighters, and Council 94. Um, but what I'd like to talk about is really the police and fire and the pensions. And the story of Central Falls actually is a little microcosm of a lot of things that we've heard today. Uh, the Central Falls has, has uh, two pension plans, or had two pension plans prior to the bankruptcy. Uh, the first one was a 1% plan that was formed in the 1930s and truly was like kind of this disability benefit plan. Uh, it was pay go had been PAYGO from the start, and um, it had a 65-year-old retirement, re uh, ret retirement requirement. So, and then, and that was it. It was on years of service, that was it. So, um, 
people are rational actors and they look at it and they say, all right, um, it's very hard to be a police or fireman to your 65. And also the plan was very vague. So um, people generally chose to go out on disability retirements. And some of the, uh, they were 66 and two thirds tax free versus if you waited until you were 65 years old, you would get 50%. So it's a kind of an easy choice. So from 1978 to 1988, for instance, um, during this time, uh, about 92% went out on disability. It was just set up that way. So I think at some point people realized that there was a, there was a, there was a problem and um, starting in the 1960s, they set up the John Hancock um, to, to resolve and clarify the retirement system as a, as a local plan. And um, so, you know, they, they had a 20 year, any age, as long as you put 20 years in, you could retire. And it was, it was pretty clear cut. But the problem is you might have changed the system, but you really didn't change uh, the culture that was embedded in the existing op, uh, institutions in Central Falls. So for instance, what does that mean? Well, first of all, you didn't change the, the economics. If you went out on a disability, it was still 66 and two thirds tax free versus if you did wait your 20 years, you would get the 50%. Um, and uh, you didn't change uh, the fact that pension boards, there's a mayor appointee, and most often were retired members of the police and fire who were used to this idea of, well, you know, when, when time is right, let's go on disability. And the um, mayors also used it. We could see that you, know, you had to have some sort of turnover in the system. So if you needed new hires, you know, just got some people off uh, to create open positions. So one of the things um, when we started, uh, so we went from 98% from the 1978 and 1988, where 92% 98, are on disabilities, and we only went down to 60%. So obviously people still were going out on disabilities even though they had a system that allowed them to just retire in, in 20 years. So what we had was um, an average age at hire um, was 26, an average age to retire was 48, and the average years in service was 21. Uh, it's pretty much split evenly between fire and police. And um, how, did you ch how did we get to change this idea that there were so many disability uh, pensions, because obviously they come out of the general fund, but they have to go into a pension fund. And if the city wasn't making the ARC, which it wasn't, um, any sort of payment, meaningful payments to the ARC, and also if the city um, wasn't raising taxes to make those payments, uh, obviously it's all gonna crash down, and that's, that's what happened in Central Falls. So when I was negotiating uh, with the unions, I used the, the math problem to, to solve the cultural problem. And we really discussed these numbers. And the, the unions themselves and the people in the fire and police, they knew about it, but they had never spoken about it. And we spoke about it very clearly and that what had happened and how financially, when you made a decision or when the council approved a decision for somebody to go out on a, um, a disability pension, it was a very financially significant decision. You have to, as we discussed, fund that decision. And well, they didn't see that and they weren't funding the pension, they just saw it in the general fund. So um, it was really an education of the math, showing the math to the, retire, uh, to the actives and um, really looking at what was in the CBAs uh, prior to the bankruptcy. And I'll give you some examples of the things that we did. One was hypertension. Uh, high blood pressure. Uh, prior to the uh, bankruptcy, the language in the CBAs for fire and police had, uh, as long as you had two doctors uh, saying that you had hypertension, uh, 60 days automatic, you were sent off on a, on a disability pension. 66, two thirds, tax free. Uh, we changed that, obviously. And actually, by the way, hypertension and stress uh, were, were um, reasons for 49% of the disability pension. So obviously this was something, it was, it was easy to do, they made it easy, uh, pension, nobody was arguing about it. 
So one of the things that uh, we worked together and came up with was actually to change it to 12 months of a rehab. And if there's, there would be no disability if it could be controlled by either exercise or um, medication. Um, disability, we changed, uh, we changed the whole dis the, we changed the whole definition of disability. Um, and we said, okay, there's two types of disabilities, and we really recognized that disability, if you were totally and permanently disabled, and we even defined it in terms of the social security um, definition of total and permanent disabilities, if you, if you, have, if you are unfortunate enough in the line of duty to, to be totally and permanently dis disabled from any sort of work, obviously we, we wanted to uh, make sure that that person was okay. So in that case, the person would receive two-thirds, um, at 66 and two-thirds, but for life, because we're recognizing that this is a really horrendous problem. And, and then we said, but there's another kind of disability where you're partially permanent, poten potentially like say you're a, you're a, uh, a policeman and you, you hurt your, your finger, your trigger finger, you can't, you can't shoot a gun doesn't mean that you can't do other things. It just means that you can't be a policeman anymore. So this was a partially permanent and you can have gainful un employment elsewhere. So we said, all right, well, that's a, that's a different thing. Um, and we're going to d define that differently. And we'll say, all right, you'll get 55% until the Social Security retirement age and then regular pension, but on two things. First of all, uh, we're going to have you recertify on the disability. So in other words, um, maybe you'll get better. If you maybe you have a back sprain and you can't operate, but in a couple of years, you get better. So for a period of four years, you would have to recertify and become a, uh, make sure that you're still partially uh, disabled. But another important concept was income offset. So in other words, you can't go off, collect this disability, and then go get yourself a $100,000 job. Um, so you couldn't make any more than, your, than what your active counter part was making. So these are some of the things we did. And then also, um, just another thing was just with her health insurance, um, putting, in putting in there that, um, that you had to pay co-shares. And it really changed people's, the way they were acting. They were looking at, well, is this health plan worth, worth it, or I, I can be on my wife's. So these, these created uh, quite a big savings to the city. But more importantly, I think, with the, with the, um, with the actives, is they had seen, they were educated and found out, and they knew themselves how the city got into the bankruptcy. And once they knew that, they wanted to do everything to make sure that it wouldn't happen again. And that's, in my definition, of cultural change and also true sustain sustainability. Okay, great.